and out is what caused that hypergranulation. This is another example. You can see here this little proud flesh, right? That's what's growing. And you can see here's your clue. This bolster is way too far back. So that tube moves in and out and in and out and in and out. And that's sliding the friction right there against that very sensitive, tender stoma tissue is what grows that hypergranulation. So what do we do with hypergranulation is that application twice a day of the hydrocortisone cream and then re-educating. Always when we find complications, we have to re-educate. And the education is about just use plain soap and water. Don't use any fancy alcohol wipes or anything like that. Is that me already? That means I have two minutes, right? No, it's not me? Okay. <laughs> so um, that hydrocortisone cream and then re-educating around how to clean it and how to set that bolster, making sure it's set properly so there's not too much movement. So now I want to talk about yeast infections. And again, this is probably runner-up with the hypergranulation of one of the more common things that I see. And it's a fungal infection of any of the candida species. And again, these are the clinical descriptions of what you're going to see on the next slides. But it's the difference between bacterial infections and yeast infections is that bacterial infections don't hurt, where yeast infections can be very painful. And you'll see why in a minute. But there could be secondary lesions. Sometimes the skin looks like it's peeling away. It usually gets very bright red and looks very painful, and it generally is. And there could be little satellite lesions. What causes yeast? Well, there's a few key ingredients to grow yeast at a stomacite. One is excessive moisture. The other is a dark environment. And then lastly, a nice warm environment. Doesn't that sound like underneath your shirt where your stoma site is. It's like the perfect recipe. So that's why making sure if you've got a leaky tube that that gets resolved, or if you have bleeding at the stoma site, that that gets resolved. Because otherwise, you will wind up with yeast infection. So how do we treat yeast? You need an antifungal. There's prescription and over-the-counter versions. So Lotrimin is an example of a prescription, or excuse me, over-the-counter where nystatin is an example of a prescription grade. And they both work similarly, different mechanisms, but similarly in that they um, sort of destroy the yeast cell wall. So they become leaky and they die, and that's how the yeast gets cleared up is with these medications. But when we have um, a yeast infection, there's usually some sort of leaking. So barrier cream could be an important ingredient in the resolution of that tube site infection. Hydrocortisone cream can work on the red inflamed areas, and then the antifungal is necessary to um, kill the yeast. And oftentimes we need all three of these things. They're all twice a day applications, and they need to go on rotation, right? So I'll show you some examples of some patients where we used this protocol and recommended it with the doctor and got them on this program for resolution. So this was a patient that presented actually with some severe like bleeding at the stoma site. And once we cleaned up and had the patient retake a picture for us and show us what was under that bolster, you could see this satellite lesion here. The skin is sort of macerated. There's, um, it, it's got this sort of peeling look to it. It looks very red and painful. Okay, this is not a bacterial infection. This is a yeast infection. But there's a little clue in here about what caused this Right here at the stoma site, there is an itsy bitsy, teeny weeny little hypergranulation in there. They're like snowflakes. They come in all shapes and sizes. But this one created a mess because it would bleed so easily because it's so tender, so fragile, and then would just create a mess here with moisture and with that warmth. And in the darkness grew this yeast infection, which was very uncomfortable for this patient. So what do we do? Well, well, until this stops bleeding and the moisture is resolved, the BID application of a barrier cream, so twice a day, put some barrier cream on there. Twice a day, put an antifungal cream on there. And then the hydrocortisone cream on the red inflamed areas, as well as on that hypergranulation. Within two weeks with some hydrocortisone cream on here, usually we can beat down that hypergranulation to where it doesn't exist anymore. 
So this is what it looked like with that protocol, all three of those creams on rotation, making sure to wipe off the barrier cream before putting on an antifungal. That's what Little Miss Speedy taught me. Little Miss Not So Speedy taught me. This is her antifungal wasn't working because she would layer it right on top of her barrier cream. So that reminded me to get very specific with my teaching to make sure that they're alternated and cleaned up in between. And you can see within a month and a half how much better that tube site looked. Okay, well we're on mold, so we're almost done. All right, so occasionally we see mold in the tube. To me, that's a red flag for we need to re-educate on flushing, proper flushing, making sure that we're using that water sandwich concept. So water, feedings, water, water, medication, water. If you're using juice or foods, water, juice, water, whatever you're putting through the tube, make sure you sandwich it with water. Don't stick anything into that tube to try to brush it out of there because it's embedded in the tube. So there's no way to get it out of there. So what it means is it's time for a new tube. And so when, if we identify something like this in our monitoring of patients, we're recommending that that patient get a new tube placed or it will get brittle and crack on Friday night at 10 o'clock, right? <laughs> this was an interesting case where our, our dietitian who was monitoring the patient was doing her monthly check just to see how things were going with tolerance and then asked about the tube. And the patient said, you know, I'm flushing my tube, but this stuff won't flush out. And I flush it, and I flush it, but it won't come out. So we got some pictures, and so what we determined with this is that this is tube degradation, and it's time for a new tube. So again, it's one of those cases where we need to advocate for the patient to get their appointments and get a new tube placed, or this tube will fail as well. And what I learned later, actually, is what this can be caused from is yeast colonization. So if you've got yeast infections going on the tube, it can actually colonize through the tube and then degrade the tube. So it's important to keep that healthy. These are some home care friendly adapters that can be used. Here's an example. Instead of something like this, we had a patient that came home with this teeny tiny tube and they just had this little plug in it. So in home care, we try to make things home care friendly, they needed a little adapter. And then these were just weird combinations of connections that we encounter in the home setting and so we solved some of these problems with little, like I said, little home care adapters. This is one that we would see in the hospital but this is a home care friendly version, things like that. And I'll, I'm kind of out of time so I, I can't really talk about our NFIT transition I guess. You guys are kicking me off stage? Are we done? Okay. Is such an okay. So, uh, okay, all right, I'll try to keep it short because I know we're going to talk more about NFIT, but really all I have to say about it is um, we're in transition, as you know. I want to orient you to some language. You may have a legacy set right now. This is a feeding tube that has that standard opening. We refer to that as a legacy feeding tube. The feeding bags themselves used to look like this, right? And now they have this little NFIT connection with a white. Christmas tree adapter, so we're sort of in this transition set phase. If you've got a legacy tube, you're plugging this transition set in if you're pump feeding. And then future state or current state for some folks, if you have an NFIT tube, which is what this piece is, um, the feeding bags and syringes can plug right into that. And so the purpose of NFIT is to create a connection that's not compatible with IV connections. NFIT is designed to keep tube feeding connections just compatible with tube feeding products and to um, make them incompatible with IV connections or other connections so that there's not a misconnection and we're, so we don't wind up feeding tube feeding into an IV line, which has happened. And so that is the purpose of it. So the syringes are also necessary in order to flush feeding tubes and administer medications. So if you've got an NFIT tube, you need an NFIT specific syringe. And for us in home care, you know, we have to make sure that our stuff connects to your stuff. So we're always looking to make sure we know what sort of tube you have. Or if you transition to a new tube at home, we're providing you the, the compatible pieces so that you can actually successfully tube feed. So we talked about the language that we use. If you have a legacy tube, 
Um, or if you have an NFIT tube, and they also have hybrid tubes out there where one port is NFIT and one port is legacy. Um, we do know that there are some challenges with the transition just with regards to um, providing supply chain management throughout the continuum of the healthcare um, journey that a patient may make has been one of the areas in which has slowed down the transition, and some of that has been mostly contained within the NICU or the very small, low-dose infant syringe sizes and delivery systems and translating that from hospital to home. So we have had hospitals that have transitioned. We've got some children's hospitals where in the NICU all they're pr um, placing our NFIT tubes, um, but we haven't seen it across an entire hospital system just yet. And I know that there's a, some research, the last thing I'll say is that there's some research going, being organized right now to develop a cleaning protocol for the NFIT tips, and that will be studied in the acute care setting, so we should see some publication on that by January, and then we can translate that into home care about um, the cleaning eff efficacy and safety. So that's it. Thank you, everybody. We will. We'll have some time for questions later. Thank you, Cynthia, very much. Um, my pleasure, what I thought we'd do in the interest of time is we're going to uh, group our next three speakers. I'll talk, talk about them now. Um, all, all definitely related to, to tube feeding. We're going to hear from uh, Lisa Metzger, who's with Oli, Oli staff, director of community engagement, which is Anne, our editor of our newsletter. She has been from the forefront involved in all, all the information, uh, certainly become a, a resident expert in fielding the information on, uh, on NFIT for us. We're pleased to have Dr. Manpreet Mundi with us, who's the assistant professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. He completed his medical school uh, in, in Keck School of Medicine in Southern California, but who wants to hang around California all their life? So through a transition uh, through the NIH, uh, joined the Mayo Clinic, initially studying uh, fatty acids and metabolism, and subsequently uh, joined the staff in the area of nutrition and clinical focus of, on obesity. He's currently the medical director and the Home Enteral Nutrition Program and Associated Medical Director of the Current uh, Natal and Enteral uh, Feeding Program at the Mayo Clinic. And he manages about 1,000 patients per year uh, on both programs. So a very busy man, and we're pleased to have him. Uh, our third speaker in this cluster would be uh, Shuvo Jo Tai uh, Guha, who is a uh, PhD in Mechanical Engineering. All those little drawings that you see of things and all the things that we carry around in us take somebody who knows how to engineer them. And uh, uh, he's been working in research at the Center for Devices and Radiology Health, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, for over five years. His expertise in complex multiphase flows, and which he has authored and co-authored uh, over two dozen peer-reviewed uh, reviewed publications. This is big stuff. This is important. All this stuff uh, takes a lot of information and engineering. And I understand he's a proud father of a three-year-old Tubi, so he's part of our club as well. So with that, I'd like to call Lisa up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Terry. Um, we thought that it would be smart to just kind of bring you up to speed on what the Oli Foundation's been doing in all this time as things are transitioning to NFIT. Um, it's been kind of a hard time in some ways for some of our community to understand what's going on, and it's a big change. Change isn't easy, um, and it also has an impact on people's day-to-day -day lives. So um, we just wanted to tell you a little bit about Oli Foundation and then how we've been involved in trying to bring the stakeholders together so that there's discussion and conversation and hopefully a good outcome. So I think I have some slides, not anything major. And this is very quick, should be painless, hopefully for all of us, including me. 
Um, so the Oli Foundation's been, well, I've been, in, I've been introduced, so I'm the Director of Community Engagement and kind of by default have rolled into this position of trying to keep abreast of what's going on with NFET. Um, oh, I guess I'm in control here, sorry. I'm usually behind the scenes, so this is a new for me. Okay, so the Oli Foundation was founded in 1983 by, by Dr. Lynn Howard and her patient, Clarence Oli Oldenburg. Many of you already know this, some of you don't. Um, we, the Oli Foundation strives to enrich the lives of patients dependent on home enteral and parenteral nutrition. So we have a, a dual, um, dual purpose in some ways. In some ways, a lot of the interests overlap and in other ways they're very different. We, we pursue this through education, advocacy, and networking. We're also a resource for the consumers, families, clinicians, industry representatives, and other interested parties. So there are a lot of interests rolled together in the Oli Foundation. Um, I wanted to say that in this mission statement, it's not specific, but we represent a, a really wide range of diagnoses. Our patients are really diverse and I'll have very individualized needs, which is really something that needs to be taken into account when you make changes um, of this scope. So the misconnections, as, as Cynthia was saying, the, the stated goal of ISO 80369-3, which is the standard that is driving the change to NFIT, is to increase safety and prevent misconnections reduce the chances of a misconnection. Can't say it's gonna prevent it. Uh, misconnections affect all of our members. They affect parenteral as well as enteral. In fact, in some ways, maybe parenteral more um, because they are at, at risk for being, having a misconnection. Um, and our, we do believe that the goal of the um, of NFIT and the, the transition is to create a safer situation without creating unintentional negative consequences. And I guess that that's part of what the dialogue has, has become is how to, how to make it a positive change. Um, so this is a statement that was developed with the approval of our board. This is pretty much our stand on things. Um, and I'm just gonna read it out loud. It's the safety and well-being of all nutrition support consumers, all nutrition support consumers, that's enteral and parenteral, is at the forefront of all that Oli does. Oli is aware of several issues and concerns surrounding this change, um, which is partly why we're all here. And we are committed to facilitating open dialogue between consumers, member of industries, and, and all of the stakeholders in essence. So, and we applaud the effort to reduce tubing misconnections, which is the stated goal behind this initiative. So this is our formal position. Um, it's, I think it says it all. Um, it's not simple, but it says it all. This is how we see the stakeholders. There are a lot of other organizations, the Oli Foundation and um, Amy and Aspen and the Institute for Safe Medicine Practices, and uh, I think I've got that right, the, as well as the consumers and caregivers, clinicians, representatives of home care companies, of industry, infusion providers, the FDA. Um, there's a lot of parties that need to come together to make this happen and to make it successful. There's hospitals, there's the home care companies, as stated. It's, it's, it's a very complicated thing. Um, and these are some of the things we've done in the attempt to bring stakeholders together. So tube feeding device manufacturers have been invited to the Oli Foundation conferences since we started having the conferences. And GEDS has been exhibiting and talking to consumers for the past three conferences, at least. Um, GED says the Global Enteral Device Supplier Association, thank you, um, represents a, a group of the manufacturers, not all of the manufacturers, but a, a significant amount of them. And they've been bringing the, the prototypes to the OLE conference to the patient, and they've been um, there have been hands-on opportunities for the, the consumers to see what's coming. Um, we've actually had our tube feeding workshops, which is this session where they've been manufacturers lined up at tables with their prototypes out and consumers could try them and manufacturers got feedback on their products and 
a lot of the manufacturers actually had not only their sales force here, but they also had their um, product development force here and engineers to see what, what, was, um, what the needs were. So our goal has been to facilitate that dialogue and to try to make things move in a, in a productive direction. Um, we did a survey to our rolling members to see how they felt about NFID as it was being proposed. It, it helped us to develop some um, agenda for a summit that we held in Atlanta. At the summit we did, um, I'm supposed to do five minutes, I have no idea. I'm okay, okay. Um, at the summit in Atlanta we had a morning session where we brought the consumers and industry together. We actually had consumers run through their protocol or their, um, their regimen. Some of them had blenders. We had Vitamix kindly donated a blender for us, and we had um, a lot of consumers there, a fair amount of consumers, and they did their what they actually did. And manufacturers were very interested in what they did and asked questions about what they did and how they did it and what size tube they had and what their, what their device was so that they could kind of put all of that information together. We had blenderized diet there. We had um, some display of how people vent or decompress. Um, and I can't remember some of the other issues we talked about, but it was a, it's actually on YouTube and it's still there on our Oli YouTube channel. We, not the morning session, but the afternoon session, which is FDA was there. Um, one of the heads of medical devices, Scott Colburn was there and other representatives, Gedsa was there, manufacturers were there and consumers were there. And it, it was really a very productive dialogue. Um, and that, that's what's on YouTube, that afternoon session. And then we also have been instrumental in helping to distribute um, some surveys, that the old, two surveys that Mayo has done. And Mayo will be, I don't know if Dr. Mundi will be discussing some of the results, or he will, um, it, after me. And then um, Mayo and FDA have been doing research for the past two years, um, last year and this year. And we've been kind of trying to help with um, bringing, when they ask for recipes, we have solicited our membership to send us those recipes. And um, I know that FDA has followed up with some of those where people have really gotten back to us with exactly what kind of tube they have, how long it takes them to administer their, their um, diet. And so it's, it's been a really productive conversation where we've been able to bring that information to the parties that are involved in, that are interested in, in gathering that information. Um, Oli and the Feeding Tube Awareness Foundation helped coordinate a listening session in May, May 22nd, for FDA staff. FDA staff was able to ask questions of about 10 consumers who went to Silver Springs and sat with the FDA and answered questions and talked about what they do. Um, this we feel it's our responsibility to continue to inform the community of the changes and, and the um, what's to keep everybody up to date on it. It's, it's a moving target. We keep trying to, it, we put it in the newsletter and sometimes by the time the newsletter is in print it's a little different. But um, we just keep trying to put all the information out there. So we have it in our newsletters. We have, um, Mayo has been presenting at both our conference and at, at the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition conferences. Today we have Mayo and FDA presenting their research and their updates on our website at that link. And we try to encourage an ongoing conversation with the stakeholders. So with that, we segue into Dr. Mundi's talk on the research from Mayo. Thank you. Thank you, that was a perfect introduction. And I'll apologize now to Dr. Harvey. I'm gonna go over uh, on time. Um, what I'm hoping to do is to kind of cover our journey in terms of NFIT testing. Uh, it's been a long journey, so I needed about an hour and a half, but they gave me 20 minutes. We'll see how it goes. Don't start the clock yet. So perfect. 
And I don't have any disclosures. I think that's also important to mention, at least from a Mayo standpoint. It was important for us to do this research kind of on our own uh, without funding uh, from any major organization. So a lot of this work has been done by our dietitians and us on our free time, which you can imagine we don't have much of. Um, so why are we doing this? And I think Lisa and Cynthia both really did a great job of outlining this. Uh, we're mainly making the transition to NFIT uh, to prevent misconnections. And this is what we typically see in a hospitalized patient, especially someone in the ICU. There's multiple access points, there's multiple catheters, and so there's multiple opportunities for a misconnection to occur. Uh, many of our patients will have Foley catheters, IVs, central lines, even the NFIT or uh, even the enteral tubes themselves have multiple ports. Some will have a balloon port, a gastric port, je jejunal port. So you can see where all these misconnections can occur. Um, and this is a common thing that we actually see in the hospital. I think it's underreported, um, you know, where flushing in the balloon port, causing the balloon to rupture, tube falls out, um, you know, or uh, another example is feeding into the gastric port into, instead of the jejunal port um, in a patient who has gastroparesis causing a lot of nausea or abdominal pain. So these are common things that we see. Uh, and I think Deborah Simmons has done a great job. She presented last year um, on outlining much of this. It's nothing new. Uh, some of these examples of misconnections um, have been quite severe, you know, such as giving uh, cow's milk that was intended to be given in the stomach accidentally in an IV port. Um, you know, many have led to deaths and other serious consequences. So this just continues. I think with this in mind, um, even our big organizations like the Joint Commissions has recognized how serious misconnections are. So with that, um, here's what GETSA stands for. Um, GETSA was formed and uh, really working on transitioning to a connector that will only connect to enteral supplies to minimize misconnections. This is not just us in the enteral field that are undergoing this change. You know, other access ports will also go through this change. We just happen to be the first. So we got lucky. Um, so this is the idea behind GetSend. I'll go through some of these quickly um, because this is really when we became involved was in 2015. I think that's when our group started to realize that this transition was happening, 2014, 2015. At that point, we were given sort of this timeline of transition really being pushed by a California mandate that forced hospitals to make this transition to minimize misconnections. So with that law in place, um, there was sort of this timeline. Our group started to look online, look for peer-reviewed journals that had published on NFIT, and we wanted to make sure that this transition was gonna go smoothly, mainly for our own selfish reasons, um, but we also wanted to see what sort of data was out there. How were these tubes performing? And we felt that, you know, GEDSA and the tube manufacturers had done a great job at that time of making sure these worked for hospitalized patients, especially pump feedings, but we couldn't find data regarding what we thought were common scenarios uh, in the home setting. The problem was even bigger. So when we did this sort of initial research, we also saw, you know, there's a lot of research in the nutrition field in ICU patients, um, but not much in the home setting. We actually didn't understand the scope of the practice at all. We didn't know how many patients were on home enteral nutrition. Dr. Lynn Howard had done a study that went back to 1992. So that was the last time that we had looked at the prevalence of home enteral and parenteral nutrition. At that point, there was a registry. I think it's the North American Parenteral and Enteral uh, uh, Nutrition Registry that again, voluntarily gather data on all, you know, uh, patients, whoever submitted the big centers, um, on how, how many patients were on parenteral and enteral nutrition. They used that registry data combined with Medicare data 
to extrapolate that about 33,000 patients were on parenteral nutrition in 1992, and then about 150,000 were on enteral nutrition. Um, since then, it had not been repeated. So we had no idea how many patients were even on enteral nutrition out there. Uh, so that's kind of where we started. We didn't have the registry. The sustained registry had kind of started to um, uh, stop at this point. So we went to our infusion companies and talked to Quorum, Option Care, and Bioscript. And as you can see, this is data from uh, 2014 by Harris Williams. It's an audit um, that showed that these three companies controlled about 21% of the market. Uh, Express Scripts controlled another 5%, and then the rest were all independent um, supply companies. So this is important to note. But we went to these three companies and said, would you be willing to share your data with us? Um, and fortunately for us, they were. We, we signed confidentiality agreements. Um, and with that, we were able to at least share data with all three of these companies' information combined. And so what they were doing was they were servicing together about 16,000 patients on parenteral nutrition and close to 100,000 patients on enteral nutrition. Uh, and this was the breakdown of insurance coverages. And with that, we were able to then come up with a ratio of Medicare to non-Medicare insurance. And that's right there. We then started looking at Medicare data. Uh, and we got data from 2013. They released this after a few years, so it's, it's going to be readily available now. And then Medicare covered uh, almost 6,700 patients on parenteral nutrition and 114,000 patients on enteral nutrition in 2013. What was also very interesting to us, and this was something our reviewers of the manuscript just could not believe, uh, was that this 6,700 parenteral nutrition patients were being, the orders were being signed for by 6,700 providers. You know, with the sustained registry and even uh, the North American parenteral and enteral nutrition registry, it was a few large centers that were contributing data. So the ratio of patient to uh, center was almost 40 patients to one center. But when we looked at it, the reality in the US is more like one-to-one, -one, where much of enteral nutrition and parenteral nutrition is being signed for by a provider who's just managing one patient per year. We had to confirm this Medicare data with our insurance company data. Um, we went back to them, and it was almost 86%, I think, in parenteral nutrition of the providers out there were just covering one patient per year. So that's. That's sort of enter on parental nutrition. But again, using all of this data, we were then able to estimate that there is about 25,000 patients on parental nutrition and 437,000 on enteral nutrition. So enteral nutrition has increased significantly since 1992, since that 150,000 number. Parental nutrition, on the other hand, has decreased slightly. Um, so in terms of us, I mentioned that selfish reason. Um, we also started, you know, and this, this started around 2012, is when we started consolidating more of our enteral program. The parenteral nutrition program formed in 1975 under the care of Dr. Kelly for a long time, um, was training between 900 and, uh, 90 and 100 patients per year um, on an annual basis. Um, the enteral nutrition patients, on the other hand, were really, again, under the management of uh, providers out there, primary care providers. So they would get a tube placed in the hospital, be discharged to their primary care provider, and asked to manage. We really changed that. We followed Dr. Kelly's model under parenteral nutrition and adopted it to the enteral side and started following these patients way more closely. Um, and when we did that, we saw that actually at Mayo Clinic, about 800 new tubes were being placed on an annual basis. So it was a lot. And then as we started following these patients closely, we found out that there's about 2,000 patients per year just at Mayo Clinic Rochester that have a tube and come through. So as we're following these patients closely and making the transition, if something isn't going well, 
we're going to get a lot of phone calls. So that was the reason for us making this entire journey. Uh, and I think both Cynthia um, and Lisa kind of mentioned, we want to make sure that some of the unique issues that are present for a home enteral patient are also covered. Uh, I think we'll cover medications uh, a bit later, but our focus uh, was really to make sure that our home enteral nutrition patients who perhaps were not using pump feeds um, also uh, were serviced well by transitioning to NFIT. Um, so with that, we devised, and I think FDA has been a great journey. Suva Jyoti has helped tremendously in designing some of these, these studies. Uh, but we designed studies to measure flow rate, mimicking gravity flow, uh, and also looking at blenderized tube feeding. So I'll go over that data. I will go through this quickly for the sake of time, but always uh, will be available for question and answers even after uh, the meeting. So this was sort of our rudimentary uh, flow data. This is when we first borrowed uh, a prototype of NFIT back in 2015 um, and devised this sort of technique to just measure, hey, what happens? How quickly does um, formula flow through Entral, you know, tubes, and again, we use the same nomenclature of legacy, which is the tubes that we're using now uh, versus NFIT, and that's when we started to see that, especially for some of the bigger tubes, the results for NFIT were a little slower, but it was quite variable between the different NFIT prototypes. So you can see here NFIT A. Uh, resulted in a, a, a longer time period to flow that 60 cc's of formula across different formulas, but NFIT B wasn't that bad. And we saw this over and over again with all the different French sizes. So with this, you know, our initial thought was, and, and again, I don't have an engineering background, um, but we were just looking at the tubes themselves, and our initial thought was, well, obviously, in order to meet that NFIT standard, the internal diameter, the smallest constriction that's there, has to be less compared to the legacy tube. But that actually wasn't the case. We had our engineers dissect some of these tubes and then look at the shortest constriction that's there. And you can see across the end, these are the two NFITs they were pretty much the same as the legacy. So it was something else that was going on that was causing that slower flow rate, uh, which can be encouraging because that means it's not the standard in itself, but perhaps the design of how fluid flows through that can really change flow rate. So uh, with that, uh, you know, we were able to then present this data uh, in December at the OLE meeting. Uh, that was the first time I met with the FDA. Um, and then we had Getza partner with us and provide us tubes so that we can actually move forward with full on testing um, of this. And so this is a lab we had set up on our clinical floor. We took over one of the patient rooms, brought in a table. You can see how happy they are uh, to be doing this. So uh, Lisa Epp here, Wanda Duhlman, uh, these are two uh, home enteral nutrition dietitians. And then Jacob Davidson was a poor uh, undergrad who wanted some research experience. He, he, was a, he is a math major, and so we used him for a lot of our statistics, but um, after we did this testing, he never returned uh, to us. <laughs> we'll get new students, I guess, if anyone wants to volunteer. Um, but so this is... This is the results that we found, and I'll again go through this quickly, but I'll make some key points. So in terms of the flow rate, and this paper is out already, uh, but in terms of the flow rate, what we did was, these are the individual tubes that we were able to test. So there's five legacy and three NFIT for uh, 14 French. Um, and you can see, again, there's quite a bit of variability. To be fair, the way we did it was, um, it's so hard for us to statistically analyze each legacy tube versus each NFIT tube. There's just too many variables there. So we combined NFIT together and we combined legacy together. So that's what you're seeing in this table and you're seeing the flow rate here. It's giving you how many mils 
per second can flow through these tubes. By doing that, we saw that for the 14 French, there was a statistical difference. I think this was covered in the morning uh, session, but this p-value, we really look for it being less than 0 0.05. And that means there's less than 5% chance that this difference is occurring just due to random luck or chance. Um, so anything that's bolded is statistically significant. So you can see that for the 14 French, there was a difference. But clearly from the graphs, it's something to do with this tube, the E1, that's bringing down the flow rate for the 14 French aggregate a as a whole. This tube was redesigned and perhaps, you know, it probably needs to be redesigned again um, to kind of look at it. So, um, but that's what we found there. In terms of the 18 French, again, really no difference in flow rate. In terms of the 20 French, again, no difference. And you can see we're testing this across multiple formulas. Uh, so it's not just one formula. The 24 French, this is where we thought we would see a difference. Obviously, the 24 French tend to be our larger bore. Uh, and there you do see a difference. So there um, you see that the NFIT tubes, uh, the formula flows uh, slower. And in some cases, uh, it flows almost one and a half times slower. So this is where... Um, you know, those, those power users, you called her speedy, <laughs> power feeding <laughs> users uh, who want to provide their formula in five minutes, it may take a bit longer with the NFIT tube. So I think we'll have to educate our patients, um, you know, who are in this scenario, uh, especially the wrong button. So in this kind of 24 French scenario to make sure uh, that we follow them closely and that they're still giving the full formula and not sort of cutting it off or having any other difficulty. Uh, so that was our flow testing. Um, and again, this is with the help of Oli. Uh, we were Oli, uh, tube feeding awareness, and many of our infusion companies, we were also able to do a much larger survey, trying to understand the scope of this practice. Um, and. I've been able to uh, create some slides for this survey, but unfortunately, just because of timing, we couldn't finish all the work. 1,700 patients responded to this, so I think it's gonna be fantastic when all the data comes out. But at least in terms of the tubes themselves, you can see that for the pediatric patients, um, m most of them are using a 14 French tube. Uh, the range is kind of in this 12 French, uh, up to 18 French for some. But our adults, on the other hand, are kind of in this range uh, where they're mostly using 18 French, 20, uh, and some are even using a 24 French. And when we kind of extrapolate this back to those 400,000 patients who are on enteral feeds, even this 7.5% is a lot of patients, so if you do the math. so. We wanna make sure all these patients are supported and how we transition them um, you know, to end fit well. Uh, the other thing we noticed, again, kind of looking at this, was blenderized tube feeding. So with blenderized tube feeding, this is something that I think none of us knew was happening. Um, so Reinhardt tells this story much better than I can. Um, he, he couldn't make it here. He had to cover the service so I could be here. Um, but he, you know, he talks about a conversation, a discussion, you can call it, um, that he had with Lisa Epp, where Lisa kindly educated him that patients are doing things and putting things in um, their feeding tubes that they're definitely not telling uh, their physicians about, like alcohol. Um, and one of those things is also blenderized tube feeding. We still kind of didn't believe her, so we actually went to the length of creating a survey, um, validating it, and then giving it to our patients. And we found that, well, uh, she was right. So more than half of our patients at Mayo Clinic were actually using blenderized tube feeding in some capacity. Still, we're kind of skeptical, uh, didn't believe her, so then we partnered with Oli and we said, oh, well, what about Oli members? So we sent this survey to Oli members. Uh, again, got a bigger response this time. 
and found out that of the pediatric respondents, now obviously these are their parents or caregivers answering for them, but close to 90% were using blenderized tube feeding for an average of 71% of their daily needs. In the adults, it was 65, 66% for an average of 56% of their daily needs. So this was something clearly um, that was going on and perhaps we all just were not aware of. Still didn't believe them. So this is data from um, the latest survey where we've uh, partnered with Oli, tube feeding awareness, and our infusion companies to really get a much broader net. Because again, you know, mem as you know, uh, I think Oli members tend to be more engaged. Perhaps they are more likely to use blenderized tube feeding. Uh, and that's what we're seeing. So when we, we surveyed this larger net of patients and got about 1,700 patients, we can see the numbers are more like about 30% of pediatric patients are using blenderized tube feeding and uh, close to 18% of adults are using tube feeding. So going back and extrapolating this to our data of 400 something thousand patients is still a lot of patients that we wanna make sure can transition to NFIT well. And this is how they're doing it. Most of them are actually using syringe push. So with that in mind, the last set of data will be what, how we tested this. And we essentially used the same sort of syringe push. Uh, we got a hold of our orthopedics colleagues who use this machine to measure tensile strength of bone. Um, and then we said, hey, can you measure the force it takes to push some of these formulas through? And they said, sure, and it worked. Um, and so this was our preliminary data with the prototype. You can see that here. Uh, for some of the blends, we saw higher force uh, with um, the ENFIT compared to current. Um, so this led us to then develop uh, a more robust study. Uh, we again tested different formulas like Jevity, Nourish, uh, real food blend, so some of the commercially available blenderized tube feeding. And then we also used a recipe that we had been giving to patients. At this point, we also did additional testing and found that the blender also matters. You know, you could use a, a kind of off-the-shelf cheap blender versus a Ninja and a Vitamix, and you get a different viscosity and a different particle size in terms of what these blenders were producing. It also mattered how long you blended for. So not only are you a speedy you know, uh, feeder, you could also be a speedy blender and get two big particles um, that could affect all of this. So there's a lot that goes into it. I think that's why this journey has been so long because we're trying to capture as much as we can, but uh, it, it's hard. Um, so here, uh, and I think Wanda even uh, deserves a lot of credit here um, she did a lot of this blending early in the morning to bring it in uh, so that the lab could run these tests. Uh, but this is just a picture. Uh, Jacob was still here by then. <laughs> so the, these are the results that we got. Same sort of graphs. Um, again, you can see all of that variability, um, but you can see that only statistical significance was in, um, in the 18 French and their NFIT tubes were actually required less force. Uh, I'll go through these quickly. For Nourish, there was no difference. Uh, for real food blends, and this is what we saw with some of our thicker blends. This is where I'm hoping the FDA gets better results because obviously they'll have more robust equipment. But our machine maxed out at around 36, 37 Newtons. And so anytime the pressure went above that, it couldn't give us a reading. So that's what you're seeing. But in the readings that we got, no difference. Um, then you, you see the data there for our own recipe at three minutes. Again, we had the same sort of max pressure issues for some of them. Um, and I'll go through these very quickly. So that's why there's so many testing. I mean, we had to do a lot of tubes at three, six minutes with all the different blenders that are there. Uh, I can go through these afterwards if anyone's interested. But this is kind of the summary slide. Um, and this shows that, uh, as I mentioned, the Jevity results, the Nourish results, there's no difference between NFIT and Legacy in terms of the force reading. Real food blends, no difference. 
In terms of the mayo recipe, the only difference we saw was in the 14 French where the NFIT tubes required slightly higher pressure. So that was the big difference in terms of the force, um, comparing legacy to NFIT. We did additional studies, because now we have all these variables. We've got all of these recipes, we've got the different tubes, and then we've got legacy versus NFIT. Well, which is more important? So we worked with our statisticians and they helped us do um, this kind of analysis, and we find that when you throw in all these factors and they try to adjust for each other, the recipe and the tube size were significant. So those are the ones that have an impact, whereas legacy versus NFIT fell out. So we also did this um, in another way. This is where we just looked at our own recipe because we wanted to add the blender component and the time component. And so when we do that, you can again see that tube size, blender, and mixing three, uh, blending three versus six minutes all matters. But again, the legacy versus NFIT fell out. So that's kind of been our journey for the sake of time. I'll, I'll kind of just end there. Um, and First of all, thank you, Holy Foundation, for having invited us, for having given us this wonderful opportunity to share our research. Uh, so today we are coming from the research side and regulatory side of uh, Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And this is perhaps in our center's history for the first time uh, where we took a peek into your kitchen, uh, into your kitchen habits to understand how transition to NFIT uh, might have an impact on your lives. Um, so it started about a couple of years back. Now Manpreet has already described some of that journey. Uh, but we started uh, around 2015 re receiving emails with three major concerns that you had specific, some of you had specific to commercial as well as uh, home-based diets. And these were, would my device after the transition flow more slowly? Would they clog more frequently? or would they require more force? So our research was catered to uh, answer these questions. Manpreet also talked about how in the latest survey we learned that about seven, more than 70% of you are using commercial uh, diets and the rest of you are using home-based diets. So we did it in two phases. The first one was to understand the impact using commercial diets and then the second one was to uh, understand the impact using home-based diets. So in the first phase, uh, our study was similar to uh, what Manpreet's study uh, entailed, and that constituted of eight different brands of devices, four of them legacies, dangling-type legacies, transitioning to two dangling-type NFITs, one low-profile transitioning to one low-profile NFIT, across four different sizes uh, that pretty much um, covered the diversity of the device sizes used in US population and seven different diets to encapsulate the diversity in the thickness of the diets. So the diets look like this, where the x-axis is representative of a qualitative metric. Uh, I didn't find too many words to describe this. So you see water, that's, uh, that's there. We start with water as our control and go all the way up. By the time you hit to some of uh, hit this commercial diets, it gets pretty slow in gravity feeding them. Uh, so that's where we stopped with the uh, commercial diets. And the uh, y-axis is a quantitative metric of viscosity that I'll continue to refer through the rest of the talk. Some of them were overlaps, just to do a lab-to-lab -lab comparison to see how Mayo's findings are similar or different. And our, uh, what we found with water, uh, isosource and nourish were that our findings were uh, pretty consistent across the board. 
Uh, and this one, we are grateful to whosoever uh, one of you recommended this diet because that helped us understand clogging with some of these commercial diets that will eventually also help us with uh, the home-based diets. So our gravity flow study was pretty similar to what Manpreet has already described. So you start by clamping uh, the device, fill up the uh, device with 60 ml of the uh, fluid and then we would unclamp and start the timer at the same time and record the time it takes to dispense a specific amount of volume, which will then help us determine the flow rate. What you're seeing here is a snapshot of about 72 experiments specific to this diet. It's a hydrolyzed formula that we use, piftamine AF. It's some presented in a somewhat different fashion than what Manpreet just described, so I'll go a little slowly. L stands for legacy, E stands for NFIT, uh, L1 transitioning to E1, L2, L3, L4 to E2, and LLP5 is a low profile transitioning to uh, a low profile NFIT. So the x-axis here is different sizes, uh, what, and the y-axis is a flow rate measured the way that I had just described. So let's go uh, by starting, let's see, why, why aren't the animations? There we go. All right, so uh, we start with 14 French E1, or L1. What we found for this specific device was there were two changes, not just the end fit, but an additional change that was made in the design of this device that caused a significant slowing of flows. So somebody uh, using this specific device transitioning to end fit might actually see more than doubling of the feeding time. Uh, but this is not specific to NFIT because had it been, then we would have seen it for this specific size, we would have also seen it with other devices, which we didn't. So with, it's odd. The animations are not catching up. Um, what we found, I think we just missed one animation, but what we found was, now they are. <laughs> um, what we found was L2, L3, L4 transitioning to E2 would not see a significant slowing of flow. And then with L5 transitioning to E3, uh, the flow rate would be pretty similar. So a 20 minute feed would continue to take 20 minutes. Um, as far as 18 French is concerned, there was less diversity uh, in that. Uh, L1, in fact, transitioning to E1, would see a re decrease in the flow rate. So the feeding time would now 20 minutes would may take somewhere around 16 to 18 minutes. For L2, L3, L4 transitioning to E2, there was somewhat more diversity, uh, but L2 and L4 wouldn't see much difference, but L3 would see somewhat slowing of the feeding time. Uh, the diversity in 18 French is pretty similar to 20 French, so I'll jump to the larger board, and that is 24 French. The diversity here was the maximum. Uh, what we found was L1 or e, uh, L2 transitioning to E1, E2 would see a significant improvement in feeding time, so a 20 minute feeding time here might actually see 14 minutes now. However, For the largest size, L3, L3, for these two, L3 and L4, we see that there was reduction in feeding time. So a 20 minute feed uh, might take up to 30, 31 to 39 minutes. And the reasoning behind it is the differences in the designs within these tubes. So L1 and L2, if you look at their connection sections, look more similar to E1 and E2, where E1 and E2 have a 2.9 millimeter internal diameter. Um, that, so L1, L2 performs more similar to E1, E2. However, for the larger board, 24 French, L3 and L4 have a more simpler passageway and wider passageway um, and that has faster flows. So that's what we found with the gravity flow. And this finding was, again, consistent with Mayo Clinics across other diets and also consistent across several diets with our studies. So with that being said, I'll now move on to the next segment, which is the clogging question. I don't know why, oh, there you go. 
So uh, we found that flogging was extremely rare across all these commercial diets, uh, except for uh, orange juice that has a lot of particulates. It has submillimeter uh, going all the way up to five millimeter particulates in it that caused a lot of clogging. Um, and then when you get to higher end of the viscosity, you see a lot of clogging um, because the diet is very thick. Uh, however, the clogging was not found to be specific to NFIT. Next comes the more po most popular mode, which is pushing the diets through. Um, so in this case, you see a picture of a unit with a force cell, which is pushing the syringe that's completely full here. Uh, and then the computer here records how much force is being required to push the diet through. Uh, this particular unit has the capacity to go up to 1,000 newtons. So we were able to measure uh, all the diets that we have tested. And uh, in the next picture, it's when it has been completely dispensed. Uh, so the computer here records the data where the x-axis is the total displaced volume as a, as a function of distance, and the y-axis is the force, and we report the average force through the rest of the talk. So for our force testing I'm about to share uh, is a bracketed study. I don't know why the animation is taking. Um, and in this, uh, we eliminate L2, L3, given the similarities L2 has with L1 and the similarities L3, L3 has with L4. So what we found is if you are pushing your diets, these commercial diets, this data that you are about to see just for the brevity of this stock is with real food blend. Um, what we found was that NFITs were ac actually requiring less force. So you see 14 French data here and 24 French data. Um, L1 transitioning to, again, to remind you, E1. Uh, L2, L3, L4 to E2, uh, and so on. Uh, so it required less force. One of the other things as we started um, communicating with OLE and Feeding Tube Awareness Foundation was that there's a lot of diversity in how you push the syringes. So, so we encapsulated that. So if you do a five second push, uh, like you heard earlier, even then we found that the amount of force that it requires is more, but uh, it was still that uh, legacies were requiring, sorry, NFITs were requiring pretty much the same force as the legacies. With this one exception, uh, 14 French E1, which had undergone two design changes, not just the NFIT, but another additional change in its design, which was contributing to it, for it to stand out uh, compared to the other ones. So this was not specific to NFIT design. So moving on now to the, so what we found for the, the major takeaways for our, these major three questions, where my, sorry, my animation is lagging for whatever reason, but generally a 20 minute feed would take 14 to 30 minutes. For a subgroup of 20 and 24 French dangling tube users, a 20 minute feed may take 31 to 39 minutes. Uh, but with this one exception of 14 French dangling tube users with, for this one brand where there was an additional design change where the feeding may take 40 to 80 minutes. And clogging was not preferential to NFITs and that it doesn't necessarily, uh, NFIT design doesn't necessarily require more force. With that, I'll come to the next phase of our study, which, is, which was done based on your input. Um, so when we reached out uh, to the tube feeding advocacy groups with the kind of blenders that are being used, the time of blending, um, as well as what kind of metrics you're looking for, for the consistency you get, um, or what are the ingredients, we got all kinds of responses. It's working good. Okay, okay. Thanks. Um, so these are the kind of responses. Just a quick snapshot. So our study, in total, we received 20 different uh, diets. And then we had to trim it down to focus on six diets that would encapsulate the largest diversity um, that's being commonly implemented. At the same time, we also tried to take into account so, some troublemakers. Uh, such as blueberry, some thickening agents that might pose problems. Um, so, sorry. Uh, so we considered one gravity feed for adult, one pediatric gravity feed, 
uh, three adult syringe feed as well as one pediatric syringe uh, feed. And this was a bracketed study, uh, especially given the number of variables that are involved um, in order to uh, quantify the experience of the patient. So the results that you will see is specific to the device or the kind of devices that the consumer is using. So one of the other things that we learned is that the patient diets are typically much, much more thicker uh, than the commercial diets. So what you are about to see is a trimming of this data. Uh, if you look at the x-axis now, we have expanded it. We have incorporated some of your uh, consistency inputs, such as thin pancake-like, McDonald's shake-like, or malt-like. And the y-axis you are about to see is going to expand. So before, we were only about 100 or so. Now it has been expanded to 300 and it's gone out even up to 3,000, which means it's 3,000 more times more thicker than water. Keeping that in mind, these are the diets that we have considered. So we start at the, at the level of water, then we consider the next one, which is somewhat thicker, consistent with uh, some of the uh, less thick commercial diets. Then we reach this coffee blueberry diet, uh, going all the way up to enchilada. So let's start with the coffee blueberry diet. I call it the transition zone diet because this is where if you get to any thicker diet, then all devices clog. And if you go to thinner diets, then all devices work fine. So this diet has its own interesting story to tell because one of the input that we received was a handful of walnuts or a handful of blueberries were being used. And we have, uh, it's common practice for us to wear gloves, not because of allergies, just just common practice in our labs to wear gloves. And when I was wearing a medium-sized glove, I would find that if I were instead wearing a large-sized glove, my, there would be a 20-gram difference in my handful, which would have an impact on the results. So you see a picture here where it's thinly uh, flowing as a stream from one container. And then, then you see uh, particulates, a qualitative metric of particulates here. Most of these blueberries and walnut pieces are of the same order as that of the infant dimension, which is 2.9 millimeters. So keeping that in mind, you're about to see uh, some of 240 experiments. So I'll go gradually with them. So if you, uh, in this particular case, the consumer use, is using a one minute uh, Ninja for blending, and then 24 French is likely the device being used. Uh, there is only two legacies uh, which work under that condition, and none of the other legacies and none of the other NFITs work at that condition. But this is not preferential to NFIT. If it were, then we would have also seen L1 and L2 and the other legacies not to work uh, uh, in this condition. So then we move to increasing um, the blenderizing time, and what we found was we saw some improvement I have to use both. We saw some improvement here in clogging. So some of the devices were flowing through with NFIT, but it was not enough. So we had to then resort to using better blenders. Uh, so we, we went to Blendtec and we went to Vitamix, and we found even the time of blending, like Manpreet was talking about, might have a significant impact. But we can eventually get to a point with these better blenders where uh, NFIT devices start working pretty well. What was also interesting here was that the low profiles are always more prone to clogging. So low profile NFITs as well as low profile legacies, both. It's not that the low profile NFITs are to, tend to clog more, but they tend to clog equally as that of the low profile legacies. So in other words, a dangling NFIT has a clogging that's less than low profile legacies and low profile NFITs and better blenders can eliminate that. The other aspect with this diet is when a dev device is clogging. So we are now back at this 24 French one minute where everything is clogging. If you were to push, so we did a push study in that situation, then the amount of force that it required with the legacy, so these are the two low profiles. Low profiles always take more force, uh, but the amount of uh, force it requires with the NFITs 
compared to the legacies were actually still lower. The other interesting thing to this was uh, walnuts or blueberry peels are not uh, big enough to pose any obstruction, so they can easily be unclogged by pushing with a little bit of force, where two pound force is equal to that that's required for flushing with water. So for some of you, for gravity feed diets, if there is clogging, then one of the options is better blend, blending increase time. If that doesn't help, then pushing with some force or using a higher end blender uh, and increasing the blending time. Uh, next comes the enchilada, which uh, I consider the worst case because uh, in this case, we used as little water as possible to create a very thick diet that you are about to see in the next picture. It's more like the texture of, um, I would say, peanut butter. Um, and if we go in, in adding any less amount of water, the blenders don't rotate. Uh, and also, the amount of force it takes to uh, push it is extremely high. So some, several of us tried to push the diet in, and we were finding it excruciatingly difficult. So by this point, you would essentially need a, a Arnold Schwarzenegger with a feeding tube in order to push this diet in. Uh, even under the, oh, sorry. I think now I'm confused with two different pointers. Uh, so in, even in this particular case, we did not find um, that the infit was requiring a significant amount of more force compared to the legacies. So with the rest of the diets, I won't go through each one of them, uh, but essentially give you a snapshot with these three of the other ones. There were no surprises with what I have already discussed. For example, with the gravity feed, we found that the feeding time uh, with this low profile for this uh, four-year-old might see some slowing. So a 20 minutes uh, feed may take 22 to 26 minutes. Uh, for this particular uh, consumer who has already migrated to NFIT, uh, their experience would remain similar. And then with this sirloin diet, uh, we found from the same uh, consumer who also shared the enchilada diet, we, uh, we found that the NFIT is not going to necessarily take more force. Uh, so to summarize, there are no surprises compared to what I already did uh, share with the commercial diets, except for the fact that the dan dangling NFITs are less prone to clogging compared to the low profile ones. And with that, uh, our next steps would be to publish our studies, complete the data analysis, and I'd like to again thank every one of you who shared your diets, Holy Foundation, Feeding Tube Awareness Foundation, and Mayo Clinic, and our interns who ran thousands and thousands of experiments so that I could share some of that with you today. Thank you. If we, yeah, we're in the interest of time, uh, what we'd like to do is, I'm sure there's lots of questions, and we have our speakers and our FDA reps. Uh, we'll move on to our last speaker, and uh, please stay with us. We originally planned a little break before the um, session starting at 5.15, but uh, let's skip that. We're all, all ready, ready to go, and we'll, we'll use that for questions. I do remind any parents that have any children in the... Uh, um, with the uh, child care group that we ask them to get picked up. And that'll be at 5 o'clock, and we'll, we'll make sure we flag you when that time comes. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce doc Dr. Mark Klang. He is a research pharmacy core manager at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. Dr. Klain works for Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and has been active in specialized nutrition support issues for his entire career. Although he works in a lab and has most, almost no patient contact, he has devoted much of the time in his career studying issues of drug administration through feeding tubes. He's active with the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition and has made many presentations on this subject. He is especially interested in what happens when the feeding tube ends and is past the stomach. So let's welcome Mark. Can't wait to hear from you. All right. Oh, boy. You guys stuck it out to the end. All right. So which, which one can I do? This one's going to be my forwarding. Okay. Um, yeah. So 
I don't see many patients in my facility, but I do have an opportunity to crush a lot of drugs. I like to cause clogs. That's, that's what I live for, to cause lots of clogs. So, um, and so they asked me to come down here to talk about the NFIT issues. Um, I didn't have an opportunity to actually work with the NFIT devices uh, in many of my studies, but I did look at many of the issues that are associated with it. Also, I have a disclosure to make. Uh, BD uh, hired me as a uh, consultant, more like an insultant, actually, to them. Uh, and, um, and so I got to see some of the designs and uh, situations there, which I can't always talk about. But I am going to talk about some of the issues that I think are really important that haven't been mentioned so far. So, um, oh, I can see it down here. Okay, so um, as you guys already know, it's different. It requires special adapters, et cetera. The other way sometimes is considered faster than who knows whether or not the port is actually an issue. You know, I thought was interesting is that this whole state connected. Uh, I got one of those little tube attachments they're handing out at the uh, JEDSA thing. Uh, mine uh, at back in my lab says uh, stay connected 2014. And maybe we'll get around to it soon. Anyway, that's what I thought was interesting on the bottom there. Uh, the thing that gets me about the uh, NFIT is pharmacy. Uh, pharmacy hasn't actually been involved so much with the drug preparation. It's not always been a, a, an active participant in preparing drugs for, um, for feeding to use. But now in the hospitalized setting, they now have to take an active role. In the past, if uh, a patient was on a feeding tube, it could easily just be put into an oral syringe. Now it has to be put into a special NFIT, and the pharmacist has to be aware whether or not the patient has a feeding tube or just needs a liquid. And that's going to be a change in dynamics as pharmacists now have to be familiar with the issues of uh, administration. Um, if uh, one of the th uh, devices with the NFIT is that it has a straw attachment that if you mix a drug, you put the drug in a cup, you crush it up, you pull up the, uh, the volume uh, from that cup, those straws are quite fine. They do not accommodate chopped up drugs. And as uh, our speakers have already pointed out, is that solids will cause problems. So most of the times in the past, we said crush and flush, it went through a uh, Tumi syringe, there was no problem. Now with the NFIT, there will be a, a bit of a gap. Um, also, one of the things I noticed we did audits of hospitalized patients. Most of the order entry systems in the hospitals do not specify the feeding tube route. We did an audit of our own institution. We found 90% of the orders where medications were being administered through a feeding tube, the feeding tube route was not indicated on the order. And so now we have to adjust for that type of situation. Um, before, we had a uh, attachment was male to female, now female to male. There's actually a certain amount of dead space that's on the end of the syringe. So if you look here, um, there's a, uh, is there a pointer on this thing? No, no, whatever. Uh, whatever. So if you look at the feeding tube design, there's actually a dead space on the very end. And when you try to draw it up with a straw, you get air into the syringe. Pharmacists hate having air in the syringe because that means they're handing out an inaccurate dose. It takes actually longer time in order to prepare the dose. So there we go. Little red, and also there's a bit of residue that sits. Oh, hi. Right. Oh, that's the pointer. Oh, hey. Oh, yeah. All right. So somebody has the point. All right. So there's a little bit of re residue that sits on the end here, and that has a tendency to drip. Uh, also, as you pull up with a straw, you get air holding into the situation. ISMP came out with some uh, stuff on this. ISMP, wonderful organization, Institution of Safe Medical Practices, looked at the issue that this dead space that's sitting on, oh, hello, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to go back. There we go. The uh, dead space on the end here actually contributes to the volume of the syringe. And with that, if you draw up a very small dose, you can actually wind up giving a much larger. So if you're giving a concentrated medication, you have to be very careful with the NFIT design. They have made an adapter for this device. 
that uh, allows you to uh, avoid uh, the, um, this type of error, but it's something to be concerned about. Um, you guys already heard this stuff. I'm not going to belabor that. This is I thought was interesting. There's a company out there making a, uh, a brush to go into the uh, other end of the feeding tube. Apparently, it's accumulating a lot of the enteral products. I don't like that. I don't like dirty tubes. But this is something that we are going to have to be uh, thinking about. The, uh, they have to be brushed because they do accumulate. Because as the drip comes down, there's sort of a collar at the end. Here, let me see if I got that back here. Go here. Come on. Go back. There's a collar on the end. And so this area here accumulates residue. So we're going to have to be concerned with that. Um, this is a YouTube video. Uh, my student uh, helped me out with this. There is a, um, there we go. They used the proper way of drawing up a syringe. And while they were drawing up the syringe and making the connection to uh, the tubing, drips were occurring. It was not part of the uh, actual demonstration to show that there were drips. But we found that when we tried to do manipulations uh, in my lab, we found that there were uh, drips occurring. It's because the reservoir on the end of the syringe actually holds fluids. And when they make the connection uh, to the fitting, it actually causes drips to occur. Where that becomes a significant issue, I work for Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Everybody knows what kind of drugs we play with at uh, Sloan Kettering. So we're concerned about that dripping out. Uh, some of the uh, medication issues, uh, those who haven't heard any of my talks before, there's uh, issues associated with the uh, thickness of the drugs. Um, shiny tablets, if you ever have to crush up a shiny tablet, remember that they're, a lot of times they're shiny because they're in order to enable you to be able to swallow them easily. The shiny they are, the more they also will react with water and they will form a gel. And uh, we've seen a number of problems associated with that. If you have drugs that have that type of shininess, them, if you use an acidic liquid like maybe apple juice or something like that, you actually will cause less clumping. That's a, always an alternative. Um, also, mixing with water enhances delivery. But if you only use water with some of the shinier products or coated products, uh, they will also uh, cause clogging. Keep in mind, a lot of times, the one of the reasons the drugs are have a shiny coating is that they are what they call enteric coated, so that they're trying to avoid deactivation with the stomach acid. You should check with the pharmacist to see whether or not crushing is going to be a, a significant issue. Um, rinse. Snakes in the grass. Most of the excipients are considered grass. That is generally recognized as safe. But they also uh, are contribute to the formation of clogs. Uh, thickening agents, they allow you to keep the suspensions uniform, um, allow the drugs not to settle out so that when you draw up a liquid, that the entire, whatever dose you're trying to aim for will be uniform throughout. The problem is, is that they also have a huge amount of cellulose. Cellulose does not dissolve. And believe me, I have tried to work with that as an agent. When you have a product that has a lot of cellulose, you're going to require a lot more rinsing. So if you uh, look at any medication, and you look at the tablet, and the tablet says maybe uh, 5 or 10 milligrams, but your tablet is large. Take, for example, I don't know if anybody's been on Lipitor. Lipitor is a 40 milligram tablet, it, but it's the size of, you know, some choke a horse. Uh, it's got, the reason for that is because the drug has very poor solubility. So in order to enhance that delivery, what they do is they grind it up to a very, very fine powder, mix in a lot of cellulose so that when you take it, it basically explodes. And in exploding, allows for the drug to be distributed in very, very small particles. That also means that there's going to be a lot of cellulose in there. So when you give this drug uh, through a feeding tube, you've got to use a lot of rinsing. We did a, a cyclovir. We took a cyclovir tablets. I don't know if you've ever seen those lovely items. I mean, you know, really want to choke somebody with something. And uh, we put it into a test tube with about 5, 10 cc's of water. 
the cellulose started to expand. It came out of the tube, rose up. We thought it was going to take over Brooklyn. But uh, it's, it's a lot of fluid. When you see tablets of that size, consider that you're going to need a lot of fluid in order to get them through the tube. Um, a lot of drugs have, um, a lot of the newer drugs that are being developed are active on the cell surface. So therefore, on the cell surface is more lipid, lipid-based. They have poor solubility. So a lot of times they have excipients and other ingredients added in order to make them more water-soluble. They also will require more fluid. Uh, they're designed to be to dissolve in the stomach, and they get absorbed once they reach the jejunum. So, do your swell. That's what it is. They got to swell up. So when the drugs go into the stomach, they react with this acid and then they get dissolved. So, we're putting together a, a list. We've got I've got a, a tables of about 300 medications. Um, we haven't worked them all out. But one of the things we find is that a number of drugs, when we crush them up and add them to water, they ha have high osmolarity. The osmolarity is the amount of stuff that is dissolved in a particular liquid. If you have a very high osmolarity and you put that into an environment that has a low, like your stomach or even lower into the genome where there's very low residual capacity, you actually will feel a cramping into that environment. My advice, uh, dilute it a little bit more. The, um, Mesna, um, not often used here. Metformin, uh, any patient has been on metformin, if you crush that up, you'll find there's a lot more GI. If you add more water, you can avoid that type of uh, interaction. Um, also, I also advise patients who getting meds through the feeding tube, look at a website. My favorite website is rxlist.com. Um, it tells you whether or not the drug has low water solubility. And that will give you a clue whether or not you're going to need a lot of extra fluid in order to administer the product. Uh, if you see an ingredient uh, called povidine, uh, povidine is a uh, co-precipitate, and many times drugs that have that have uh, a lot of solubility issues. Um, there's something called class four drugs. I don't think you'll find that much in your literature. I have difficulties finding it in my literature. And Drugs who are class four have very poor water solubilities and poor transport. And so it's an area to consider. Um, so what else we got here? Um, what's this? Rinsing the tube, uh, as I mentioned, the beads are interred coated. Um, they, a lot of times see the resistant, uh, allow for resistance to acid, mix it with the juice. That's the best way to do it. Um, if you're if your feeding tube is past the pylorus, uh, don't use the juice. You need to get that entire coating off first in order to have the drug delivered in that environment. The pH is the important. The best way to do it is mix it with sodium bicarbonate, baking soda. Allow the product, the entire coating, to come off and then flush. Uh, drugs that have this type of problem, uh, pancreatic enzymes, um, tamsulosin is also another agent. Uh, and uh, all the PPIs have enteric coating. A lot of beads are in, are in uh, products. If you open up the capsules, you'll find there's a lot of little tiny beads. Where this became a problem, I noticed uh, two drugs, uh, Emen and Spornox. It turns out those particular drugs, the beads are not enteric coating. What they are is the drug is actually sprayed onto the surface of a sugar granule. And as the sugar granule dissolves, it takes the drug with it to allow it to dissolve. My recommendation in drugs that have this type of problem, don't try to mix it in a cup. What you do, open up the back of the syringe, put the, open up the contents, put it in the syringe, pull up fluid, and allow it to dissolve in the syringe. Keep it all together. Don't separate it. There are form pharmacies out there that will mix up an Emend or other products in a bottle. Most studies that we found, the drug pretty much falls all the way to the bottom of the barrel, and uh, it falls out of solution. Best thing to do in low-soluble drugs, keep it in the same syringe. You'll find it a lot easier and, and more reliable. So I tell people if it's scored, it can be crushed. Somebody brought it up to me in one of the talks, um, not for toprol. So you got to read the actual literature on this sort of thing. Uh, toprol is actually a wax matrix, doesn't crush up very well. That's another thing you have to be careful with. 
shards. Somebody tried to crush up Lipitor, it doesn't crush. Some of these drugs are very hard type of tablet. It's easier to let them dissolve in a syringe than it is to try and crush it with a mortar and pestle. You probably will find it almost impossible. Not a mortar and pestle, more like a sledgehammer in some of these drugs. Try to crush a, a ciprofloxacin tablet. That's, that's one for you. Put a whole, put a, actually we have a, uh, many of the nurses use a, uh, a packet that they use, uh, they put into a machine called a quiet crusher and they pound on it in order to break up the tablets. Ciprofloxacin was so hard that it poked right through the bag. So something to consider about. One of the things we're always concerned, and I have to mention in every talk, is uh, extended release. Be very careful. Make sure your product is not extended release when you crush it up. Drugs that are extended release can get, release the entire contents very quickly and wind up with toxicities. Uh, this one drug, uh, Trental, is also known as doxyphylin. It can cause significant effects if you crush it up. But you could put it into a liquid formulation and administer it more frequently, and it's safe to give in that fashion. Hazardous drugs, that's what I live for. Uh, don't crush oral chemotherapy, but you still could put the drugs into a syringe and allow it to dissolve. There's a new chapter of, of the USP called Chapter 800 that is addressing a lot of the issues for healthcare workers because of their exposure to chemotherapy. One of my concerns is that extra drip that's on the end of the NFIT syringes. Is that going to expose workers to when I prepare a product, a chemotherapy agent, in an infant syringe, will that drip before it's administered? And that, I need, that we need to resolve. Um, some, things, some injectables can actually be given uh, through the feeding tube as an alternative to uh, capsules. Uh, we found that etoposide and cytoxin was okay in that setting. Um, because if you have a drug that's in a capsule form, you don't want to open that capsule if it's a chemotherapy agent. On the same hand, capsules don't dissolve very well in the syringe. So that's another area. Um, there's been a, recently I got a call, they, they wanted to um, um, give finasteride, uh, Proscar. It's a common drug for men with uh, uh, prostate issues. Um, it turns out because it's a hormone, if you crush it, and you expose the worker to the powders, it is a male hormone, and if that person's pregnant, it could affect uh, the, the worker. So this has become an area of concern. So what we've been trying to do in that setting, again, take the drug, put it in a syringe, draw it up, keep it contained. Uh, that's gonna be an issue. Uh, I just got a call uh, yesterday uh, about this other drug, uh, Panabinostat. It's a uh, new chemotherapy agent. It actually has uh, AIMS, uh, AIMS test is a uh, test of whether or not it has a, uh, a risk of carcinogenicity is exposed. Again, another type of thing. It's a drug that, oh, it's a drug that needs to be kept in a syringe. Syrups are thick, try to avoid them, dilute them. Uh, I, always, I always try to think, pharmacy compounding is the big issue. Pharmacists like to use or sweet in their mixings. And I always tell them, if the patient has a feeding tube, they don't really care about the taste. So there's an alternative agents, Oral Plus or, and Searspan. That's another alternative. I also run across a number of compounding pharmacies like to use simple syrup as a, uh, as a mixing agent. Try to get them out of that habit. And osmolarity, we kind of already talked about. Oh, there was one thing there. The, uh, um, we actually gave generic Lomatil one time, and uh, it caused diarrhea. Uh, the, uh, di the drug was actually used in order to treat diarrhea. It had sorbitol as the excipient in the product. Use a lot of water to avoid the clogs, and thick as a brick. This is uh, one of the drugs we broke up here. As you can see, cellulose can really accumulate in, in some of these syringes. Here's some of our other clogged syringes the amount of excipients can really get thick. So you need a lot of stuff in here. Capsules don't dissolve. And the best way to dissolve a clog, a lot of water. That's our, so our studies we've already published on that. A lot of uh, uh, nurses tell me they've used colas. And colas work if it's a drug. Okay, I'll sh shut up soon. There's a new device out called Tube Clear. It's very expensive. 
Uh, but it's really a cool device. Breaks up the clogs very quickly. So, and my recommendations, rinse uh, for tubes greater than 80 French. Uh, the internal port is a little smaller. Uh, anyway, rinse and rinse often. And that all closed. Okay. Thank you very much. We've got uh, Joy in the back. She's got a couple of microphones organized. And officially, we are going to have a break at 5. But we do want to get back into our agenda um, for the rest of the open discussion on tube feeding. So with everybody, unless anybody screams and yells, let's get right into a uh, question period. For any of our speakers, what we ask is you put your hand up. We'll get a microphone to you. Um, we'll ask that our speakers maybe uh, sit in a panel up, up front. We've got microphones for them as well. And uh, we'll get this done. So with that, please raise your hand. And yeah, we'll get our uh, friends from the FDA up as well. And the panel can, uh, there's uh, two live microphones for them to pass amongst themselves. And we should have two microphones on the floor. Is, is Cynthia Reddick here? Yeah. <laughs> if she comes in, we'll have her join up on the panel. So, questions, anyone? Raise your hand. Tess, Remember, can you hear me? Clock, no? Can no, you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, great talks today. I have a question for the FDA folks. Did you test different gravity? Bores, small bore versus large bore, and did you see a difference there? The gravity bags and the gravity bag study, they have large bore gravity bags and they have small bore gravity bags. Bags. Oh. <laughs> bags. bags. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> No, ours only included syringes, so we but, didn't do Okay, it. so when you were saying gravity feed, that was with the syringe, not yes. the gravity bag? Yes, yes. 60 oh. syringes. Oh, yeah. that's a good clarification. Yeah, thank you. It, it, was, uh, it was already going to be cases and cases of formula just with a 60 cc syringe, so if we added the different variables, I mean, we would it would double the number of tests. Okay, yeah. I just saw the word gravity, and I was thinking gravity bags versus the syringe feed. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then my, I have one more question. Mayo? Hi. Um, so with the enteral um, population, did that include oral or was that strictly tube feeding with that number of tube fed patients? Um, you mean the overall 400,000? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that was Medicare covering just tube feeding. Tube feeding, okay. Yeah. Uh, no, no, the 400, the reason we got that number is we contacted our infusion companies and we used billing codes, and so those codes would only apply for people who are on tube feeding. So we got the data from our infusion companies and then found a ratio of Medicare to non-Medicare, then used Medicare data and that ratio to estimate how many are on there. But the codes we used, we wanted to be very conservative those codes would only apply to patients who are on tube feeding. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. My question is for Dr. Klang. And I was wondering if the 300 drugs that you tested at Memorial, if there's a way to get a list of that, is it, has it been published? Uh, no, um, that's still a uh, internal document. Um, it's in a database. And uh, I am working with uh, a group right now um, uh, trying to put out uh, that. Taylor Francis has contacted me with uh, CRC Press, and we're trying to work out the logistics of uh, getting that information out there as a text. I believe the Aspen organization is also working on a thing, uh, on, on a textbook of this nature. I don't know what data they are using, but uh, I was asked to review the introduction. So, so I got to see it. <laughs> I got to see that they're doing something along this line. 
but I don't know where they're getting their data from. Uh, but I found that there's a general rule with most of these drugs, and that is you can pretty much guess what's going to be the problem. If you got a big tablet, there's going to be a lot of issues and a lot of more water to be added. And that's pretty much the, the information that we've been able to accumulate. I haven't found any real major issues. They seem to be very similar if you have an oral tablet. That's true. That is true. Uh, that would be a good idea. Maybe that, that would be an edge. And that and actually, that's a, uh, thank you for that suggestion. And maybe that's what we need to add, uh, a, a visual guide uh, to this sort of thing. What we do have is on this, uh, some of those pictures, we have a picture of each of the tablets, what they look like when they do dissolve or break up. And we have pictures of all those things. But I think that would be an excellent thing to add. Thank you. Uh, I would sorry. I, I would just like to um, come away from this with a sense of when is it going to conclude? Uh, this has been going on a long time. It sounds like all of you who are involved are trying to uh, be global in what you're going to conclude. But um, I think for the f people that are out there, this is very. Uh, stressful in some ways, the, the think, thought that they're going to be cut off from the tube that they have, which works. And I think it would be helpful if we knew what the timeline was. That's a, that's a tough one for us to answer. I think, you know, um, we're definitely planning on making the transition. It's just you want to make sure that enough supplies are there. I think that's that's the biggest concern for Mayo. Um, as we've been talking a lot about this, you just want to make sure that we can make a smooth transition so there's no hiccups and all the supply and everything is there. Uh, but it, it's a major, major transition. You have to sort of dwindle the stocks. And I kind of presented our own clinic's data just to show you you know, how much volume we have, and that's just one hospital. Um, and so that requires us to make sure that we can dwindle down on the stock that's there and then pick up on the end fit and make a smooth transition. Do you guys have a rough idea? Um, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. for your hospital, yeah. you have yeah, I, mean, I can't even get supplies in order to do testing because right now most of these syringes are being shipped to California where it's already uh, being put in place. And it's, I can't even get a supplier to provide me with syringes, and fit syringes, so I could do testing with them. And I'll say that we're gonna have a chance after this Q&A, when we do more of the listening session, that's when you know manufacturers and home care companies are gonna have an opportunity to come to the mic too and talk. So hopefully we can get to that. I know you have a question. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Richard K. Farms. I have a liquid nutrition company. And uh, the question's for Mayo. First of all, I want to say thank you to all of you for sorry, Kay, for uh, the panel. This was very helpful to everyone in the room. This was excellent uh, for everyone. So my question is, uh, my daughter's Kate. She's a uh, two-fed patient. I started the company for her. And I listened to a few facts that I, I had a question on. Number one, the, the growth Terrell Nutrition. I'm really stymied to why you see from 91 this, this uh, hockey stick growth in, in, unfortunately, in two fed patients. What do you feel is attributing? And, num and number two, in 2014, you have the numbers of 400,000 Terrell two feds. And the, according to what you have down there in 91, you had, how many did you have in 1991, I believe? Uh, 150. Okay. So on that trajectory, what is making Aspen publish things that we should be near 750,000 at this point now and growing so aggressively with two fed? Is it just the diagnosis is getting better? So I'll, let you, I'll leave it at that, um, asking you those two questions. What is attributing such? It, it's, that is a very tough question to answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of changes that have occurred over the last few decades. I'd like to say that nutrition support, you know, our infusion companies, um, um, 
all of those aspects have improved. So patients are able to survive longer on nutrition. I think our guidelines, and there's been some key studies that have been done that showed early nutrition, especially enteral nutrition, is so beneficial. I think that's having an impact. Um, in terms of parenteral nutrition, we've seen a decline. And there, you know, Crohn's disease is one of the biggest I could think of uh, with a lot of these disease-modifying agents that are coming out. We're hopefully seeing less and less just bowel resections mm -hmm. that are occurring. So we thought a lot about this. What are the changes that are taking place and think a lot of things are coming together, uh, but I think, you know, kudos to everyone, organizations like this, we're able to track things better, um, but in, in the end, it's multifactorial, but we're providing better care and, and allowing patients to live more fulfilling lives with nutrition uh, is, is the way I feel. Okay, could it be, la last thing to that, could it be also that um, allergies and, and more allergies in the, that have come about in the years have, have created more need. It seems as if allergens are on the increase in the world of food. I come from the retail world now into the medical world with my formulas. Could it be that it's just more, um, more allergies? Uh, I guess it's just a, a holistic idea of, of things. Could be good stuff, more nutrition options. Could be more allergies. People are getting more sick um, and more need for non-GMO, organic, pure ingredients and stuff that's coming to market. And, and that's what we're seeing with this drive for blenderized tube feeding. I mean, it's really taken us by shock, but th that's exactly what everyone is saying. More food allergies, more desire for organic, you know, non-GMO. So um, that's where we're seeing the uptick in blenderized. And I think it's a market when we're providing support for patients. It's something that we have to cover. Two more questions lined up, and then we'll trans, uh, get a transition into the next program. Thank, uh, thank you for your uh, presentations each, to each of you. Uh, I have tested in fit at home, and uh, I can. I, I did a test with a, sub, a Subway sandwich, a six-inch Subway club, one day with the legacy system, went right in. Next day, I did it 24 hours later, the same amount of fluid, could not force it through at all. So I wonder what size, uh, what, what do you, what in your test did you, uh, FDA and, and Dr. Munde, what, uh, what size ID uh, tubes did you use? You know, how are you gonna mix a 3.1 and you compare that to a 2.9, which is in fit, that's not a fair comparison. But Bard makes a 3.8 and uh, Cook makes a 4.65, which would be a, a good comparison. I don't see how you can say that things flow almost the same in a lot of instances. Thank you. So we incorporated four different sizes, uh, and if you look at their internal diameters, they range from being pretty close to that, the size, same size as that of the NFIT connector, 2.9 millimeters, uh, all the way up to pretty close to five millimeters. So that was the diversity uh, from 14 to 24 French that we catered to and compares, compared against uh, for uh, our legacy versus NFIT comparison. We did the same testing. I think we, you know, were on a lot of phone conferences to develop this the study design. So we did the same. Well, I couldn't push it through. So that's all I can say. Do, do you, everything you do is bench testing. You don't. You're not going against a stomach that's pushing out. No, that that so that's is a different definitely story, you know? one of the limits. I mean, I think we had to start somewhere, and you know, de just to jump to clinical trials with patients, I think would have been a big leap. So. We started with bench testing and actually forced measurements. I have one question and then a follow-up to that uh, question, if it can be answered, regarding the timing of NFIT becoming uh, implemented. Who made the decision or what agency made the decision that NFIT would be optional? I'll hand the mic. <laughs> So we're in a transition period, and that's why we decided that we would do a not immediate transition. 
there's not enough supply all at once. As you'll notice, certain components came on the market before others. So you didn't have the syringes for a while. Now you have the syringes. So as we transition through all this, it's going to be moving over to NFIT, but we also didn't want to just drop off those patients who are in a 24 French funnel until we knew what these results were and said, what are our options in that field? What should we do? When the FDA made the decision that the transition to NFIT would be optional, you left the decision on that timing to the marketplace. It is now a question of supply and demand. Demand is reduced significantly. Supply will not increase in a capitalist society, economy that is, until there is a demand. Home care companies are not getting NFIT for the consumers because the manufacturers are not responding to a demand for the new NFIT connectors. You have shirked that job and you have passed it on to the marketplace. Consumers are telling you they don't want it. You're unable to provide for the safety of the NFIT. Nothing is going to happen now. Do you have a comeback at all? I'm trying to hear what you're saying. So you're saying that because FDA hasn't come out and said you need it now, that the manufacturers haven't pushed it and the supply hasn't. If you would at least say that this is the timetable, recognizing manufacturers' limitations and saying this is how the manufacturers will need to proceed on these dates. That has been a part of the process since 2014 and even before that, saying an indefinite transition, making NFIT optional, has decreased the amount of demand for NFIT. And so the supply is not going to increase until you set some deadlines. Okay, so what you're asking is where's our balance on that? Should we have just early said everybody needs to be on NFIT? We don't need these results. We don't need to figure no, all this out first. No, you didn't hear me. First. I said set a series of timelines with deadlines to those timelines, recognizing the limitations of manufacturers so that you have a path toward knowing when NFIT will become available rather than abdicating your responsibility. So California set a deadline and it was a So it was a little bit difficult for them to meet that due to various reasons. So for FDA to say you need to meet it by tomorrow is a little difficult. I, but I, think I hear that what part you're of the saying. goal is to have the research to justify the transition in, in full and to see what the market needs to some degree in the conversation that maybe should have happened earlier. I think that that maybe some of this conversation could have been had earlier but wasn't. Um, maybe some of the needs weren't identified earlier, like Manfred was talking about the blenderized diet, and it's raised a whole conversation that maybe has pushed back the deadlines a bit. Is that fair to say? So I mean, a lot of things are outside of our control. What we can tell you is that we have recommended that manufacturers use this design because we feel it is safer than the older designs. And we've said that for several years. There are a lot of devices that have been cleared for the market from our perspective. Um, and supply is just not something that we control. And so that's, that's kind of tough for us because um, Medicare insurance companies, if they're not providing coverage for these devices, you know, FDA isn't necessarily going to be in control of that. So it's, it's hard for us to control this because there are a lot of moving parts that are outside of FDA's authority. Um, but we're doing the best that we can. And I just want to remind anybody who has children that are in daycare, you need to go pick them up like five minutes ago. Good. <laughs> I think with that, we'll uh, like to do a transition into the, the uh, collaborative conversation uh, about tube feeding. We encourage uh, people involved in the industry, uh, consumers, caregivers, and if you could, because we're trying to make it a conversation without microphones and so on, 
Uh, if you're going to stay, please move up to the front uh, so we can... Uh, I don't know if tube feeders and caregivers are afraid of fire or something. They're always by the back exits. But um, please move up to the front so we can uh, make it a little more homespun. And uh, we'll uh, have a quick five-minute uh, reload and uh, get organized. And uh, Lisa will bring us through the next part of the... Uh, for about the next hour or so. And I want to thank our panel, and hopefully you can stay for, uh, for the conversation as well. Thank you. I apologize for pushing so hard. Oh. Somebody has, somebody has.